Greetings, grade twelves. So this is now part three of my little series on meiosis. As a reminder, in part one, I went through a lot of the terminology related to meiosis, some of the structures that are involved, and then in part two, we went more in depth in terms of the actual phases of meiosis, going through division one and division two, and what exactly happens in each of those divisions. So please make sure that you've gone through those two videos before you actually go into this one, which is the last sort of sum up of a couple of things, and then dealing with the applied nature of meiosis that you need to understand. So this is just a reminder of what we did in the previous video. This shows you all the phases of meiosis. Reminder, if there's a 1 or a 2, that shows me which division I am actually looking at in meiosis. So the 1 being meiosis 1 and the 2 being meiosis 2. Reminder that you need to be able to identify any of these cells to be able to tell which phase of meiosis you are looking at. So that table of comparison between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 will really be able to help you with those kind of identifications. Could you, For example, you could be given something like one cell that is somewhere in meiosis and you need to be able to identify which cell or which phase it actually is showing. So knowing that difference between the two will really help you. So let's start our little sum up of the last little couple of things relating to meiosis. So the first one being, why is meiosis important? So remember, meiosis is something that we as animals need because we are involved in sexual reproduction. We are not able to clone ourselves. We cannot be like bacteria and do binary fission and just suddenly like, you know, create two of ourselves by splitting in two. We need to create gametes. And the important thing is that we need to create haploid gametes, half the number of chromosomes. So meiosis is important because it prevents a double amount of chromosomes and or double amount of chromatids when fertilization occurs. Now remember, if you take something like a skin cell, a somatic cell of an animal, and you combine it with another somatic cell, you are going to have far too many chromosomes or chromatids, depending on where you were in your cell division, for that organism, in terms of the animal, to be able to function. We are not able as animals to function with more than the diploid set that we have. So we as humans, if we have more than 46, or we have less than 46, we cannot function. That is just the way that animals are designed. So that's why meiosis is very important. Next thing, the location of meiosis. Where does meiosis take place? So let's deal with this in two separate ways. In the animals, it happens in the reproductive organs. So those being the ovaries and the testes. So those are the organs in which meiosis is taking place. Now let's remember from our reproduction that the germinal epithelium is the tissue from which those gametes are actually going to arise. So remember the germinal epithelium is contained within the ovaries and the testes for example, of humans. So just be careful if you get asked a question where it says, in which organ is meiosis taking place? That would be ovaries and testes. Or from which tissue or which cell or in which of those does meiosis take place? And that would be germinal epithelium. If we compare this to a plant, in the plant it is the anther and the ovule. Obviously plants that are doing sexual reproduction, this is the case. It is not the ovary of the plant, because remember the ovary is the protective structure of the ovule. So from the ovule, the egg is going to be created. So don't confuse those between animals and plants. Plants, it is the anther and the ovule from there. It's not there to talk about germinal epithelium with anther and ovule. It's a much more complicated process with different things with microsporangia, macrosporangia, all those kind of things. You do not need to worry about that. You do not need to worry. So the only thing that will happen in a plant is location of meiosis being anther and ovule. That's it. Okay, when does meiosis occur? in terms of like throughout the year. So we're gonna deal with this in two separate ways. The first one we're gonna deal with is humans. So in humans, because we're quite unique and special, in males, spermatogenesis, the creation of sperm happens constantly. So human males are constantly, from the age of puberty, creating sperm. Whether that sperm actually gets used, if it gets ejaculated or if it forms part of that reproductive cycle, is inconsequential because any sperm that is not used is then reabsorbed by the male. 
So we as males are constantly making. Oogenesis in the females happens monthly. I say roughly monthly. And this is where we're referring to the menstrual cycle. So yes, you can argue that technically for male, for females, right, the females, meiosis technically starts occurring in the womb. Because you have that first start of the phase of meiosis that occurs before the female is even born. So yes, you can add that as a technical criteria. But once the female is born, we press pause. We stop the meiosis from occurring. And then when she hits puberty, we then start the meiosis again, but only on a certain group of cells at a time, not all of them all together. So just bear that in mind. When I then look at animals and plants, this becomes a lot more varied and becomes a lot more difficult to categorize specifically. Because these examples of these of when it's going to occur are things such as when an animal is in heat, or we can look at seasonal cycles. So for example, if we look at plants, it may be that a certain type of plant is only creating these in spring, going towards summer, but it doesn't do it in definitely autumn and winter. It could be that certain animals have heat also based on a seasonal cycle, or based on a year, two year, monthly, two month, whatever. It could be varied. So when we, for your purposes, Anything that is in this animals and plants category will have to be given to you as a case study. You are not expected to sit and learn all that. You, you can obviously have an understanding of these things of like heat and seasonal cycles, but no specific examples are something that you're going to have to have to know. Okay, so that kind of wraps up a little bit of the how, where, and when it actually occurs. So before I talk about this importance of crossing over, what I want to say is what we're moving into is another reason why meiosis is very important. And the reason is the creation of genetic variation. So as much as I said that we are animals and we can only do sexual reproduction, you know, we cannot clone ourselves. At the same time, that is an advantage that we cannot just clone ourselves. Because remember, cloning is creating an exact genetic replication of yourself. So much like vegetative propagation and all those kind of things, where I'm creating exactly the same. The problem becomes in the environment, I generally desire genetic variation. And this links a little bit towards evolution. So the, the, there's a little bit of a cross-pollination that's occurring here. But let me just talk about the things first and we can get into it. So let's remind ourselves, this was crossing over. So remember the homologous chromosomes are going to connect to each other. We are going to have these chiasma, chiasmata. We are going to exchange some genes. So this chromatid is different to this, to this, and to this. So what that does is it increases the variety because any of these four will become one individual haploid cell. So I have a chance of inheriting any four of these. Those unique combinations are generally favorable to us from a natural selection perspective. So remember, I am wanting to have more genetic variation if I want to resist changes in the environment. If everything is exactly the same genetically, our ability to resist change in the environment severely decreases. So by having this variation, I am therefore basically ensuring my survival, lest a catastrophic disaster happens from there. But in terms of normal change in our environment, this is allowing that. But it's not the only form of genetic variation that occurs from meiosis. So there are other sources. The first one being independent assortment. So what do I mean by independent assortment? I'm referring to the way that the chromosomes, whether be it homologous or at sister chromatid stage, the way that they are arranged in metaphase. So as an example, look at these two cells here. I've got this cell where I've got the purple and the blue switching between the two sets of chromosomes. But in this cell, they have, they're on the same side. So eventually, if I was to go through my divisions, do you notice how at first division, all four of these cells are completely different in their makeup? I've either got blue, purple, purple, blue, purple, purple, blue, blue. And then if I even go further into the second division, the way that these are arranged with their sister chromatids, that will make a difference. So if you think about it, I have 23 pairs lined up in this particular cell. However, I've only switched this one pair. But I could have switched several of them, 
all of them, none of them, many different combinations. So if you think 23 factorial, 23 exclamation mark, I could have so many different combinations. Also, in metaphase 2, although these might seem similar, remember, crossing over has occurred. So I still have genetic variation within my chromatids. So even though this cell and this cell look the same, they will be different because of the crossing over. So the amount of variation that I can have just by the way that they are arranged is infinitesimally small that the chances of you being born based from this particular combination are so small. Plus, at the same time, this is only one half of a zygote. For example, if this is the male, the same thing is happening in the female. So the chances that this one sperm, with its odds of being this genetic combination, merging with that one egg that had its infinitesimal chances of being that genetic combination, just goes to show that you being who you are, the chances of you being who you are, are so small that it almost becomes incalculable. It can be, but it, the chances are. But it allows us to have this genetic variation. And then the last way that we can get genetic variation, we have already discussed, and it is the normal process of mutations. So during this process of creation, we can have things like a substitution, insertion, and deletion. So I refer to point mutation here, I'm referring to a substitution. But all of those can also add to the mutations. Again, a reminder, doesn't necessarily mean that all mutations will be favorable. There can be some that are detrimental. In the same way that all the other forms of variation that we have discussed, independent assortment, um, crossing over, it does not necessarily mean that every single variation is going to be positive. It can be that it would be a negative one. But the rather have variation than not have it. Again, try out the different variations to see if it will be better. We don't know if it will be better or not, but you do need to know that those are the different ways that we get the genetic variation through meiosis. So that pretty much ends my sum up of the last few little things relating to meiosis. What I'm going to move on to now is Actually, I'm going to leave it there for this video. I'm going to create a fourth video for you guys, and I'm going to make it to talk about the applied nature of meiosis. So I'm going to leave it there. Make sure you go through these to have this last final wrap-up of meiosis before we go on to the actual applied nature of meiosis. Thanks very much, guys.